Okay, cool. So before I begin with today's seminar, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this meeting from the lands of the Gardaí people of the Yuran Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. I also acknowledge the traditional custodian of the rarest land on which we all work and meet today, and the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting. I pay my respect to elders past, present, and recognize and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. So today we are very pleased to have Cindy Payne from the Sex Institute talking to us. Cindy leads the Institute programs of work building dynamic simulation models that inform strategic and operational decision, particularly in complex environment in which there may be multiple and competing influence and factors. She provides oversight in project delivery and builds partnership to drive the innovative use of evidence and simulation as decision support tools. Before joining the Sachs Institute, Cindy was responsible for reviewing evidence and providing advice for the Australian government's national immunization program. She has strong skills and experience in translating evidence into policy and practice in the not-for-profit <laughs> sectors, research institutes, and government organizations. She also has an honors degree in dietetics and a master of public health. So without further ado, I will just stop sharing and hand over to you, Cindy. And at the same time, just as a reminder to everyone participating in the seminar, please mute yourself. And later on, when we have a Q&A section, please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll just call you as well. Thanks. Thank you, Vanessa, and uh, I will just share my screen to present. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, right, let me just set that up. Well, thanks for, again, having me and um, to talk about this system dynamics model of minimal trauma fractures in Australia. Uh, I'm Cindy and I manage the decision analytics team at Sachs Institute. Just a quick introduction of Sachs Institute and uh, the team of decision analytics. So Sachs uh, is an independent evidence specialist and our specialty is to help decision makers find and make the best use of evidence to solve real world policy ch challenges. And um, decision analytics is a leader in the development of participatory dynamic simulation models to inform health and social policy. So the um, dynamic simulation models is one of the many tools Sachs Institute uses to support that translation between evidence and policy. And this is just a quick overview of um, the models we've built to date. Uh, and this is uh, the point of this slide is really sort of to show we're not um, the content expert. We bring the methodology and the expertise in simulation modeling and participatory model building, but we really work with the content expert to produce the models. So that includes research experts and policymakers and um, people with lived experience. That's why our topics uh, topics cover a wide range of um, topics, mostly in health and well-being, and it ranges from, say, um, healthy ageing to ICU demand and capacity, um, and one of them is osteoporosis and fracture prevention. And similarly, in terms of um, because we work with a range of partners um, and the partners hold the domain knowledge, so that allows us to work with you know, different agencies, um, for example, primary health network um, and the state department of health or ministry of health, as well as research projects, I should say. Um, we often, we're often often partners with researchers to build research, to um, work on research projects. And again, this is just a very quick, quick overview of our approach. Um, we usually take, we kind of think of our approach as in three phases. The phase one is to understand the needs and feasibility, um, you know, what the problem is and how we can use it simulation models to answer this question. Then the second phase is to work with participants to qualitatively map out the systems involved. And then the third phase is to convert this qualitative um, into a computational model with um, data and um, different sort of quantitative pathways. And across these three phases, 
we have four key components. So that includes um, participatory process and stakeholder consultation, um, policy definition and analysis. We have a user-friendly interface at reporting, policy dialogue and dissemination. And depending on the needs and feasibility of each project, um, or the four components can be small or large. Um, so we should try to tailor make the um, project to the partner's needs. But I will show some examples of this component um, in the following presentation. For example, the um, participatory process, the policy um, definition, and uh, the I will get, uh, get to demonstrate the uh, interface as well. Okay, um, a quick background on the model I'm about to present. So in 2018, MJ, MJ Australia commissioned Saxon Institute to undertake a research project to compare different initiatives in reducing the burden of osteoporosis in Australia. And at the time, there were a lot of policy debates and a lot of um, uh, potential initiatives um, being discussed to reduce the burden of osteoporosis in Australia. And um, then we developed a model, maybe I'll stop here. Um, the model we developed look, uh, looked at minimal trauma fracture as the outcome um, because that's uh, mostly where the burden of osteoporosis sits. And, um, and that's where... You know, I will. A lot of the presentation today will uh, focus on the force prevention element of the um, minimal trauma fracture. Uh, the participatory modeling process has three, I guess, main phases. Again, I like to think in phases. Um, the first phase starts with a workshop um, focusing on problem conceptualization. And as you can see in the picture um, over there, that was before COVID. So we could all stand around in a room with a big butcher paper and sort of draw on that paper with you know sticky notes our understanding of the problem of osteoporosis and minimal trauma fracture in Australia and then we convert that big pig sort of drawing into a conceptual mapping and then that was converted into a computational model with data feeding in that um, conceptual mapping and the model was refined um of a so we could reproduce historical data patterns. And after we have that baseline model, then the second workshop or second phase of the project was very much about policy prioritization. Um, I think I can see Kathy um, here in that picture, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we sort of sat around and really discussed what are the policies we want to um, test in these in, in this model and not just prioritizing policies, but also what this policy look like. So for example, if it's an exercise program, you know, how what how do we get people to participate in the, uh, the exercise program? What's the uptake? What's the efficacy? Um, what does the program would look like in real world? And what's the likely sort of impact of those program of that program? And um, so, as, so that's the phase two. Then we add these policies into the model and test, the, run different scenarios. Um, so we can, we can test the impact of these policies. Um, the phase three is what I call insights and interface. Um, so we, by testing these scenarios, we, scenarios and policies, we could come up with a range of insights and at the same time develop an interface the um, users who are interested in, and that's often policymakers and research audience, they can sort of test the different scenarios themselves on the interface to come up with their own um, sort of insights relevant to their practice. Again, I will show some sort of details um, of these outputs uh, in the following presentation. This is uh, a very high level of model structure, and you can see um, the screenshots of the model. And you know, it gets quite complicated, but I sort of walk uh, through the overview, sort of 
the, uh, of the model structure. So we start with bone health and fracture prevalence. So that includes um, osteoporosis, osteopenia, and what we call healthy bone mineral density. And fracture prevalence would include um, uh, hip fracture, non-hip fracture, in, and they're all stratified by different age groups. And then another part of the model is force and fracture mechanisms, and they then drive the bone health and um, fracture prevalence. The healthcare delivery, whether would get people on force prevention programs or medication, so that again drive the bone health and um, in fracture prevalence. Then the next component is policy interventions. After we design the policy interventions, they then change the force and fracture risks and they change the healthcare delivery and thus changing the a number of people on medication and thus bone health. Then the last components, uh, component is economics. And this one is, um, so let me just, the healthcare service delivery obviously fit into the economics. So um, the example would be when someone has a fall and ha has a fracture, then the cost of hospitalization um, would be then linked to the economics. Or when someone goes and sees a GP, that cost would go into the economics. And same when we want to test the cost effectiveness of a policy intervention or the costing um, associated with this initiative would go into the economics as well. So that's a very sort of high level view. And it, as you can see, I can mention before the screenshots, the very uh, blurry screenshots are um, the structure of the model, but it's you no, know, it would take quite a while to walk through the whole model. So I'm sort of I will zoom in to different um, sections of the model. So the next section, if we zoom into you know, the pathways to fractures, there are um, four different pathways. One is a fracture without a fall. So someone with a quite low bone mineral density, they could have a fracture without a fall. And the second pathway is a first fracture because of a fall, and that's a quite common pathway people go through. Then the second one is sub subsequent fractures due to fall. And the reason why that's separated out is when someone has had a fracture, the risk of having another fracture increases. Similarly, um, subsequent fractures, the fourth pathway is subsequent fractures without falling. Um, again, the risks in those populations are quite different. That's why we separate separated out those population and pathway. Then this is another zooming of uh, risk of falling and fracture. So um, if you sort of think about uh, how best to describe this. We're kind of peeling an onion here. So this is another layer of looking at the risk of falling and fracture. So um, I hope you can read this, but um, so for example, with the risk of falling, we've stratified that into people with osteoporosis without medication and people with osteoporosis with medication. And that's just, um, uh, okay, I, I finished this bit and, uh, and then, then after this, then they're stratified into people with osteoporosis in community um, without medication, and then people with osteoporosis in residential aged care without medication, because um, maybe I move my mouse a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, because their risk of falling is quite different, um, uh, if we compare people in community versus people in residential aged care. And then another part of this is risk of fracture. And around here, we have them stratified into um, force-related, uh, sorry, uh, fractures caused by force and fractures caused by, uh, I guess, non-force-related fractures. Um, and what I want to highlight is this is only one population group. So this is only the screenshot, the example I'm showing here is only people with osteoporosis before their first fracture. If you remember the, uh, the pathway, the four pathways I showed you before, these structures and uh, statistics related to 
all these structures are replicated four times in different um in di- in four different pathways and the um like i said the different probabilities and statistics statistics are applied for those four different pathways and the next part is economics um and so first, I guess from a high level down to more detailed, um, we decided to separate out the economics by payers. So that includes Commonwealth um, expenditures, state in, uh, expenditures and consumer in expenditures. So for example, a hospitalization, that would be state expenditures and GP visit would be Commonwealth, but both of them would incur some out of pocket ex- expenditures from the consumers. And at each variable level, so each item, um, for example, a GP visit, a radiology visit, um, each visit would have this structure shown here. So there is the annual item cost and there is the net present value inflation unit cost um, per user by fracture type and gender applied to this item cost. And then... Um, we've applied this structure to 23 variables related to economics. Um, and again, the data are um, sort of specific to each item, to each um, item cost. And then the last one in terms of the exist the model structure is just a very sort of quick demonstration of how we've um, assigned data to each component um, and the range of data we used for the model. Um, So for example, when we talk about healthcare delivery, we used a lot of administrative data set. So that includes PBS, MBS and hospitalization um, and as well as clinical audits to see service provision rate. And um, then there was cohort study, um, we're quite fortunate in Australia, we have good cohort studies in this topic. And that um, gave us prevalence and relative risk in healthcare service delivery and bone health um, fracture pre- prevalence, as well as force and fracture mechanisms. And then uh, randomized controlled trials gave us effect estimate for um, policy interventions mostly. And that's also that also related to force and fractures mechanism. Um, and Again, there was quite accessible um, cost data for things like medication and pathology. Uh, this is just a quick slide to show, uh, I mentioned model validation before, and this is to sort of show we've validated the model against, um, I guess, different very different part, um, points across the patient journey. Uh, so that includes the um, bone density scan, patients using medication every year, annual count of hospitalization of hip fractures and medication prevalence. I think this was, um, you know, we try to find points along the patient journey with good data and calibrate the model um, against these points. Okay, I've, I realized I sort of walked through the model structure fairly quickly um, because I want to sort of save some time to show the interface um, and insights we found on the, inter- I demonstrate that directly on the interface, um, but I take a quick pause and see if there are um, any questions before I go into that. Can I ask a question, Cindy? Yeah. I was just wondering for how long did the model go through? So what what was the time horizon of your model? Uh, I think it was 20 years from memory. So uh, when we built it around um, 2018, we validated, I think that probably, yeah. So we validated um, back 10 years and forecasted forward 20 years. Okay. So overall, Thank you. I guess overall 30 years. Any anything else? All right. If there is no more question on that, I will oh do this. I will share um 
the interface I've mentioned before. Can everyone see my screen now? Yeah, okay, great. Right. Um, just a second. Okay, so the interface is what um, I call a simulator. So if you think um, it will be, it's often part of our deliverables to the partners. Um, so it's delivered as part of a, a toolkit that they can continue to use in the future. So for example, when we give this to New South Wales Health, even after they you know, have the re reporting of the model insights, they can sort of use this interface, use this um, simulator to facilitate their internal policy discussion, and they can run different scenarios on the um, on the interface to see their impacts. Or even when evidence get updated, they can then sort of try different assumptions and parameter values. Um, if they have, for example, you know, disagreement with the internally, or if they want to update the, the evidence. Um, I think that will become clear, uh, clearer as I demonstrate the interface. Uh, so first, just a quick walkthrough. This is the, the home page and in the background we have sort of, we try to make it quite transparent of the process we undertook and also the model structure. Um, yeah, and also, and then what's important is this, um, this page called run the model. So that's where we'll we can test the impacts of different initiatives and strategies. I will go back to this page at, at the end to show those insights. Um, but just quickly to show you other tabs as well. So model control panel um, is basically somewhere you can change the assumptions of pretty much every numbers in the, uh, so all the numbers in the model. So for example, if you disagree with the um, assumption of prevalence of people over 50 years old who develop impaired bone health in their lifetime. Um, you think it's more like 36, well, that's too drastic. Say if you think it's a different number or new evidence comes out and say, okay, it's not as high as what we previously thought, you can change the assumption here to um, test how that different assumption affects the output of the model. And we have that, um, and you can see that output is, um, you can check sort of all these different outputs from the model. And with the parameters there, uh, with this particular model, it, they're categorized into primary prevention, all the assumptions around the fall, fracture risk, community care. So that's um, mostly primary care. Hospital care and um, economics. So even if, uh, for example, you don't think the cost of, you know, now the out of out of pocket cost is different from what it was in twenty eighteen, you can change that as well. Um, so that's just a control panel, and that sort of gives the model flexibility to be updated by users in the future. Uh, the model validity tab is what I showed you before. Um, so you can run the model and see how it tracks the historic data. The, uh, and model output is something, um, so every time you run the model, the outputs of different uh, results, different outcomes will be pr um, presented here and then you can export these results for more detailed data analysis, if that's something um, of value to some researchers or to some statisticians. Okay, like I said, I will go back to run the model. And again, um, a quick overview is on the left, these are all the pol different policy app options and you can turn them on to test the impact of those policy options um, and they, have all these information tabs to show what the definitions are. And you can also go into each policies and change the assumptions 
or the setting of the policies. So, for example, if you disagree with the rollout of this um, this intervention, if you don't think it's nine years, it should be, you know, three years or fifteen years. You can change that assumption and again see how that affects the outcomes of the model. Um, we also with this one built a custom intervention. Um, so say again in the future, there is a new initiative that doesn't fit in any of the ones we've designed so far. You can change, um, you know, if say that one is that initiative is um, what would be a good example, uh, affecting the medication initiation rate. So you can change all the numbers here and see how that affects the outcome in the model. And um, in terms of the outcome, we have graphical outcome over time. So that's all hip fractures every year, uh, all fractures every year, hip fracture and non-hip fracture. And these are an annual numbers. These are more sort of accumulative. The important, I guess, read here is their cumulative numbers. So you can see um, cumulatively what the number is from um, 2019 and um, what the result is sort of compared to baseline. And these are the, maybe, sorry, I think the easiest way is for me to just run a scenario and to show you that would be more concrete. Um, so I will show you first. So, I will show first the impact of vitamin D in residential aged care. This one was quite interesting. Um, it was uh, actually, a, a, well, first on the health income, health outcomes side, you can see over 10 years, um, it's forecast to avoid about 7,000 fractures, um, including hip fractures and other fractures. And um, the interesting part I found is the economic outcome because this one actually turned out to be um, cost saving. The main the main reason is it's actually it's a quite um how do I put this it, it's a um quite affordable intervention to be taken in residential aged care. It's a very targeted population. Vitamin D is quite cheap. They already have a good mechanism for distributing supplements and medications. So they, it fits in quite um, nicely, but it also prevents um, quite a number of fractures and then thus the cost associated with fractures. So it has, um, as you can see here, it has a um, a cost saving, a negative number in terms of cost per fracture avoided. And this page would also give you dailies avoided, cost per daily avoided, and the cumulative net benefit. And this net benefit includes both the cost of delivering interventions and the benefit of this intervention, um, assuming a cost per daily of $50,000. And from the again from the expenditure side, there is annual cost uh, stratified by Commonwealth, state, and out of pocket, and also cumulative over um, ten years. I think I misspoke before the it was ten years forecast and ten years back, so overall twenty years. Um, and then a difference from base case in terms um, in terms of economic outcome. So then run another um, intervention, which is another force prevention um, intervention in this model, is which is a subsidized exercise voucher. So when I run that intervention, it has almost 10,000 fractures prevented compared to 7,000 before. Um, and if I go to the explore button of this of this intervention, you can see it's a quite widespread intervention. Uh, I'm just going, I can show you the description of the intervention is registered serv um, services provided to adults over 60 years old to encourage their participation um, of force prevention programs. And I think the assumption 
of cost here is a hundred dollars of vouchers per year, but because exercise is quite expensive, so on top of that, um, there's an out of pocket cost of about $900 per year just from participating in this exercise. And it kind of takes, you know, say, um, I can't remember the exact number, but you know, about a year for the benefit of force prevention to kick in. So because of these assumptions, it's a population-wide, it, it applies to a lot of people. Therefore, the um, it was quite effective. The, nu the number of fractures prevented was quite large. Um, but then because it was a quite expensive program, the cost per fracture avoided was also quite high. But I think the takeaway from this is, well, first, maybe you know, if it's of such scale of benefit, maybe um, the the Commonwealth should still go ahead with it because this model only captures the benefit associated with fractures avoided, but it, um, because of the scope of the model, it doesn't capture benefit associated with, for example, cardiovascular disease prevented, um, I guess the benefits uh, associated with other disease. And um, that another takeaway is, you know, we, we can see a widespread population exercise program has that level of benefit, but maybe we can deliver that cheaper. So um, again, if I go to explore, um, instead of $900, hundred dollars out of pocket cost every year if we only need not a hundred dollars and I run the model again if I go to economics that cost per fracture avoided becomes a lot lower so I get that's what I meant before by you know there's a lot of flexibility you can test on the interface. Okay, I think that's most of the points I want to demonstrate now. Um, again, I will pause for questions and see if there is anything else you want to see or test on the interface. Yeah, Cindy, wonderful. Um, could you actually show us um, the model for fracture liaison services expansion? I'd yep. be interested in that and I'll, I'll comment on this later. Yeah. Uh, so that's the default assumption of fracture liaison service. I know it was quite specific to the, um, I guess, discussion at the time. I know there's been a lot of, it's a very active space and there's a lot happening. Um, so, you know, we can change the assumptions here to um, test different um, uh, alternative assumptions. So with the, the default assumption, the this is the number of fractures prevented and this is the economic outcome. Um, I think at the time we kind of assumed a bit of a slower rollout and a slower uptake rate than what is currently thinking. Mm -hmm. But the, the number of fractures avoided is very small over... Is this over 10 or over 20 years, the 1,480 fractures? Uh, that's over 10 years. Okay, so that's prospective. Um, still hard to believe because if you think about it in contrast to, for example, vitamin D or exercise programs, which are population-wide and... and uh, Okay, I mean, the vitamin D was targeted for... Uh, um, for aged care, uh, for, mm -hmm. for facilities. Um, but the fracture liaison services are extremely targeted to people who already had a fracture. And mm -hmm. we know that those patients are, or those people are at very high risk of fracturing again. So I wonder, mm, it, it sort of, it makes doesn't make a lot of sense because we you know we've obviously studied fracture liaison services for quite a while now mm. and our results seem to indicate that the effect of fracture liaison services on refracture rates is much greater than than what you show here i mean this is over 10 
how many sorry i mean i don't want to bore everyone but it, it is an interesting area um mm. so how, this this model assumes how many fractually asian services across australia um so a hundred fractal liaison service okay. rolled out over ten years, so okay. uh, nine years. So I guess um, if you think about how this, um, you know where this a thousand numbers over ten years come from, um, there are multiple steps of tem tempering of the effect. Mm. Um, so the rollout is probably slower than um, what. You know what could be what it could be and another thing we noticed is um we there is a bit of a mismatch in terms of capacity versus people need to be seen um so we're yeah, not I, yeah, I understand, yeah i understand that ping i mean I, i've i've obviously <laughs> cindy i mean um i've i've read the manuscript many times but mm. um it is it, it's it's kind of Difficult to understand, say, over 10 years, 1,400 fractures. So that's per year, 140 fractures prevented by a, well, I'm not quite sure, by an unclear number of FLSs that are active. Mm. That just does, that, that makes no sense, honestly. Anyway, I mean, let's leave it at that. I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to bore people with these details. But mm -hmm. what I perhaps would like to point out is that these, this modelling is always, um, well, it depends on your assumption, and that is the crux of the thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and that's why I'm always sort of open to change the assumptions um, mm. as the model develops, um, because I know sort of, evidence changes and the policy environment changes and you know we we could be just wrong at the time when we made the assumptions mm. um so like i said happy to and flexible to change the assumptions over time yeah. i mean can i just comment on that the implications of this are that we'd be better off funding exercise is that right than fls it's hard to compare <laughs> them directly um i guess part of the reason is we with these initiatives, we have quite specific definition in terms of the rollout of the people we target. Um, it's hard to sort of compare exercise overall versus osteoporosis medication overall. It's not a direct comparison. Um, I'm not sure if I explained that very well because I guess all the you know all the initiatives here are very have a specific set of parameters attached to them um so it's it's hard to make direct comparisons um, cindy with the specific fls thing um could it be if what what would uh, like is it possible with this model to change the assumptions um so for example to assume that it was already uh, scaled up um, and so use like a greater number, I guess, of people with access to a service. Yes, because yes, perhaps is. that is the sort of modelling that um, Marcus was was talking about. Yeah, yes, it is possible to to, um, to change that assumptions. Um, and I think another, um, I have to look at this in more details, but I think there is another sort of complicating factor is because fracture liaison service prevents refracture, not the primary fracture. Sometimes um, it takes a while for that refracture to, you know, if you think about the counterfactuals, it would take a while for that refracture to have to potentially happen than be potentially prevented, whereas the programs what we found with modeling um usually the broader program that prevents the sort of the you know targeting more upstream at primary prevention has a bigger number just because it, it's a bigger pool of people you're um targeting at and subsequent question does um does this model have the potential to work kind of in the other direction so if government had in the ideal world, a large chunk of money to invest in this area, 
Like, mm. could it work in the other direction where we could actually uh, sort of set the amount of money that could be invested um, yep. and then work out what would be the greatest um, number of fractures prevented? Yeah, yeah. So um, it depends on the mechanism. I sort of, I, I guess, technically, I sort of need to look at it a bit more. But theoretically, there is a possibility to, to run optimization. Uh, so we have a funding bucket of a hundred million dollars, and we can have a um a run scenario, run analysis to say, you know, this kind of program would make the best use of this hundred thousand hundred million dollars and produce this uh, so prevent this number of fractures interesting Does anyone have any other questions or comments I think I Marina. Do. Um, Cindy, I was wondering, thank you so much for your presentation. That was very interesting. I was just wondering why you chose to use DELIS. Is that a specific reason that you use DELIS instead of QALY or other measure? Um, I have to check the note. It was quite a while ago and we were very much guided by the health economist at the time. Um, I think they are recommendation was for that um, particular population for older population and for fracture as an outcome um, they thought DALI captured that better than quality um, but that is something you know if quality is more appropriate that can be changed in the future. Sure, sure. Um, and also I was wondering when you're talking about the interface is this the same software that you use to build the model as well as to present the results yeah yeah that's right it's a whole package yeah okay thank you does anyone have any questions that they can just type in the chat box uh while we are waiting actually i do have one question cindy just wonder for this interface is the private or like is it open to people to use it um good question i think we're investigating um the possibility of making it um publicly available there are you know uh, we kind of need to check the model again and check the interface again make sure it's still um i guess uh it doesn't it represents represents what we did at the time correctly, um, but we do have the intention to make this pu publicly available. Yep, thanks. If if no one else has any uh, further questions or comments at the moment, um, can we go back to the falls aspect of this model? Um, to sort of see, you know, what what potential there is for like looking at for changing, I guess, the way interventions could be delivered and um, like the costs and effects. Did you want to look at uh, these subsidised exercise vouchers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess just to understand um, what the scope is like within this model for exploring different aspects of falls. Yeah. And, you know, full disclosure, Cindy and I have been um, you know, having some, some conversations about some further work that focused more specifically on falls. Um, but I was wondering, yeah, you know, what scope there was within this model for, for changing. Mm. Um, so for this one, the assumption is an exercise voucher program starting in 2020. Uh, it will take, it will last for 10 years and it will take three years to reach the maximum uptake. And the maximum uptake of the voucher is 5%. It's not that high, but exercise programs are quite no, notorious for having a high um, take up. The age eligibility is from 60 to 80 years. And um, the assumptions around the, I reset that, the um, cost is $100 of vouchers per year. And that was assigned to Commonwealth government. And um, I do, I, about $900 um, out of pocket cost to the individuals. And if you um, 
Okay, it's just worth reiterating um, the force prevention pathways. I, I de as I demonstrated before, there are sort of a lot of different variables you can tweak to make, um, I guess, to make it a, a different force prevention program. Um, but because it's quite complex, we kind of need to check the model and make sure it's actually um you know, it fits the understanding of the of um of the modeling at the time. So, um, and maybe it's um a good opportunity. We've got you know a little bit more time um for people to maybe suggest other things that they would like to know from a model like this um in an ideal world. Um, so I think Marcus has already, um, you know, made some suggestions perhaps on the sort of delivery of the FLSs and the reach, um, yeah, and those aspects. Um, Marcus, did you want to add anything else? Like is there anything else that you would would like further modelling to be able to answer? Oh, look, when um, when I think uh, Alison was, was writing the initial draft of the paper and it sort of had this uh, expansion from I think the existing 29 to maybe 50 or so FLSs nationwide which of course didn't make a lot of sense but as maybe some of you know there is this uh, hmm, what's it called the Osteopro National Osteoporosis Strategy uh, by the previous coalition government and it suggested according you know obviously you know by um requested by or, or suggested by osteoporosis australia and now healthy bones australia that that number should be 100 across the nation and so um i don't know whether whether there was cindy or whether it was someone else but obviously people from the sax institute went back and modeled the whole thing then for a hundred as Cindy has just shown, and it was still uh, not cost effective. And I totally agree. The, the 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 conclusion from all this modeling is that FLSs are not cost effective. And it is interesting, and I hope that Amgen is going to take this to the government because we're talking about this is for policymakers. I hope that Amgen or whoever is going to take this data to the government and tells them that FLS is in the present form and the way it's been um, suggested by osteoporosis Australia, it's not cost effective. Osteoporosis management and particularly secondary fracture prevention needs to happen in primary care, not by expensive specialists like myself and my colleagues. <laughs> and not in a hospital setting. I mean, it's so expensive, yeah? I mean, I we, we run an, we've run we been running an FLS now at Concord Hospital. I think we were the first in Australia to establish one, or maybe it was uh, someone else. It doesn't really matter, but we've been running our service now for the last, um, what is it, oh, nearly, yeah, 18 years. And, yeah, we're seeing patients, and we, we, we see a very specific group of patients who have had at least one, often two, three, four fractures before they see us. And yes, we manage them, we treat them, and we are very successful with that. Like everyone else who does it right, we've published this, we have very low refracture rates, it's highly effective, but it's enormously expensive, right? This is not only just me, I, you know, I'm not the only one who's paid well. <laughs> it's, it's also the advanced trainee, it's the nurse, it's the admin, it's the whole hospital system. It amounts to a huge amount of money for each single patient we see. And we do not cure the disease. We reduce the risk of fracture, but we don't. So still people mm -hmm. still, 20% or so, still fracture. So this should be FLSs should be there for complex, difficult cases. Uh, mm -hmm. GIO, glucocorn-induced osteoporosis, osteoporosis in younger people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that are beyond what a GP can manage. But to be quite honest, osteoporosis management 
is not rocket science. It's very mm -hmm. straightforward for 95% of cases. Mm -hmm. And that can be done by the GP. And this is something we should push that GP, the G, primary care, I should be more precise here, primary care should be the hub mm -hmm. of osteoporosis management and refracture prevention, not the FLS. And so you're modeling here, while I have my... Um, you know, doubts about the assumption, but then assumptions are assumptions. We can change them. We can go back and forth and we can model this around as long as we like. But the major message is will always be the same. And I say that without using all these knobs and, and regular, you know, these little things there that you can change back and forth because I see it every day. It cannot be cost efficient in the mm -hmm. way that Osteoporosis Australia or this national strategic plan has suggested that 100 FLSs would, would change anything. It will change absolutely nothing and it will be unbelievably expensive. Mm -hmm. I, I hope somebody is going to look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was a bit long. No, no, that's that's really interesting to yeah understand it from from your perspective. I think um, I Mar Marina, yeah. yeah. So Marcos, if I understood correctly, so your concern with the present model is more so to the number of fractures that were prevented throughout the time, rather than the overall result that the cost effectiveness ratio is not as good as you'd expect. Is that is that what you're yeah. saying? You're more concerned uh, uh, not with the overall result, but with Absolutely. I mean, we, yeah. I don't know whether you, <laughs> we have published a paper many years ago, I think it was 2011 or 12, somewhere around that time, where we've done a cost effectiveness analysis with a guy called Andrew Palmer from Tasmania. Very nice chap. And we were looking at our first sort of four year data from the, from our FLS. And it really looked very well. The problem is osteoporosis is not a four-year problem. Osteoporosis is a 20-year problem, a 30-year problem. And mm -hmm. the longer we, we, and we are actually at the moment, we're running a 10-year study as uh, Mawson is a PhD student of mine he and Kirton, we're running the 10-year analysis of this, of this very same program that we published after four years and then seven years, and now we do 10 plus years. And I can tell you already, if we were to do a cost a cost um, um, analysis, it's not going to be cost effective. No, we need to we we pay we pay much too much money. We invest much too much money into uh, you know per fracture avoided. It is an effective system. Don't get me wrong. Mm. It's yeah. an effective system. It's highly targeted, and if it's done right, with other words, model A initiation of therapy in the FLS and then tell the GP what to do. That's a highly effective one. It's just unbelievably costly. Mm -hmm. And it can be done by the GP. That's the thing. You know, if you had a fracture, if a patient had a fracture, all you have to do is put them on medication, get them on fault prevention, get them exercising, some, some you know, lifestyle changes, which never work anyway. But that's all that need to be done. It's not hard. It can be done in primary care. And so, Cindy, is that modelled in here, the primary care aspect? Um, not with this current iteration. I think at the time, the thinking, as Marcus mentioned, was, you know, even the strategy was looking at FLS mm -hmm. as a hospital-based service. Um I this was quite a while ago. I know um, uh, there was already discussion around at the time whether it should actually be done in primary care instead. Um, we haven't done that. I think that will require a bit more sort of significant change to the model, just sort of structurally. It's structurally, it's more than just you know changing some of the numbers I showed you before. Um, so it's definitely something we can test. Um, build and test in the model and say, you know, if we have a program that looks like this, what would be the potentially the effect and what would be potentially the cost effectiveness? I really liked your data about vitamin D in, in residential care. The vitamin D is, and as Maria said before, we're better off financing that sort of stuff than FLS, to be honest. Um, 
but vitamin D is safe as long as people don't use uh, active vitamin mm. D, but just got a calciferol. It's very, very safe. And it goes back to a paper by Pierre Meunier in the New England Journal for 1992. Some of you weren't even born then. And they showed that in in people who, mostly people in, in, in residential care facilities, somewhere living in the community, but they were all older people. They were given vitamin D in sufficient doses and they were given calcium in sufficient doses. And there was a 40% reduction in hip fractures over one and a half years, right? That's uh, that's what I call an efficient uh, um, intervention, mm -hmm. not FLS. And uh, about exercise, I'm not quite sure. That seems to me very difficult to implement in older people. Uh, but um, the vitamin D story is a good one, and that should actually be pushed. But I guess the challenge is it's a, a mixture of sort of interventions and settings yeah. that can be tweaked. Mm. Because, um, yeah, to me, you know, you, the the issue with the oste with the FLS versus GP for delivering osteoporosis is quite a medications is a different setting, and then the vitamin D in residential care came up very well. But you know, the, we've done an update. Sue, who's you know, left, has done an update of the Cochrane review of physiotherapy exercise in residential aged care, and that is actually now effective for falls prevention. Um, and so, you know, that might end up actually having a similar impact if that was measured um, kind of in residential care. But then obviously it would cost more to deliver. Um, but, yeah, it can. And then I think Marina had a, um, a, a good question mm -hmm. about can we actually model like a combination of, of policies? And, and maybe those questions are related. So, you know, could we actually get like a best bet kind of set of interventions for yeah. you know different people in different settings and then kind of model the cost effectiveness of that yeah 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 that's a really good question i think um one of the values of this type of model is we don't have to assume um independent independence or sort of people just going through separate pathways so for example uh, if two interventions well i guess short answer is yes we can and okay. if um if and two interventions act on the same pathway they could be synergistic so mm -hmm. often the effect would be amplified and the cost effectiveness mm -hmm. would be amplified because you're sort of using the similar um you're pulling the resources together for amplified um effect um so, yeah, I think with this model, we actually had one of these findings. Uh, I can't quite exactly remember which one, but I can dig that up and um, send it to you, Marina, if you're interested. Excellent. Conscious of the time, so I might um, hand back to you, Vanessa, to close off. Uh, thanks so much, Cindy, for showing us the interface. I'm very interested for the future, whether it will become publicly available. 